All right. Well, the title of our sermon is The Workman's Hammer, part three in Judges chapter four. So in our first look at this text now, we considered the ongoing need of the people in verses one through three, the need of the people. The children of Israel are locked, trapped, you could say, enslaved, fixed into a desperate, destructive, and ongoing pattern of sin, ongoing pattern of rebellion that once again finds them under the judgment of God. Jabin, both the king of Canaan and the instrument of God's judgment against them, has them under a harsh, severe, and violent oppression. And apart from the mercy of God, his iron grip over the nation will certainly, absolutely not be broken. His 900 chariots are an indication of that, right? His 900 chariots, representative of his strength, representative of his power. And so for 20 years, Jabin, under strong military power, has successfully subdued and subjected the people of God to severe oppression. We noted from understanding their circumstances, though, as we look at the children of Israel, we look at the nation, we look at the circumstances that they continue to find themselves in, we noted that it's their own sin, their own rebellion against God that is actually the real destructive force in Israel. As much as they might like to, as we might in our sin, like to blame someone else or blame our circumstances or, worse yet, some actually blame God for the things that happen to them, this, the, the problem they find themselves in, the circumstances that they find themselves in, are actually their own fault. It's their own sin, their own rebellion. Sin is what has a destructive, violent, enslaving grip, oppressive iron grip on the nation, right? There's a moral restraint enforced under the law while the, while the judge governs the people, but when the judge dies, the intent of the heart is to do evil. They're under oppression from their own sin, and sin has led them into the circumstances in which they now find themselves. The people don't need mere deliverance from an oppressive enemy named Jabin. They need deliverance from their sin. They don't need a mere moral reformation. They need regeneration. Right? They need to trust in the Lord for his promise, and they need to put their faith in the seed of the woman who will one day deal a death blow to the head of the serpent. And that death blow is pictured here, isn't it, in Judges chapter 4. We get a little foreshadowing, a little foretaste of victory in the death blow that the seed of the woman will inflict upon the serpent, and that at the hand of the workman's hammer, Jael. Now, in our second look at this text, we then considered the command of the Lord in verses 4 through 10. The Lord has heard the cries of his people. God's merciful, isn't he? Long-suffering, patient, and kind. And God continues, even in their sin and rebellion, God hears the cries of his people. He has a covenant loving kindness toward them, and God will keep his covenant. He is a God of mercy, a God of grace. So he issues then a clear command and a clear promise that we see repeated in verse 6. He says to them, listen, go, deploy troops at Mount Tabor, take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. The Lord commands and the Lord promises. Now it's up to faith to believe the Lord, to take him at his word, and to go in and see the Lord work mightily against their enemies. Well, where in the world then? Where are the godly men of Israel who are going to take the, word, the Lord at his word? Where are the godly men of Israel who are going to obey the command? Where are the leaders? Where are the men who are going to go out against this uncircumcised Canaanite and deliver God's judgment against them? Where are the men? Now, this promise goes unrealized to this point in Judges chapter 4 because the command of God to this point is disobeyed. Like we tell our kids, right? Delayed obedience is disobedience, right? He has been delaying obedience to the Lord's command out of fear. There's no other explanation, right? Barak is timid. Barak is faithless. 
He's not trusting the word of the Lord that's come clearly to him from Deborah, the prophetess, that the Lord will deliver Sisera into your hand. Go out and take it. Reminds us, doesn't it, of the Israelites on the border of the promised land. And they sent out the spies. The spies come back, 10 of them with an awful report. They're giants of the land, fortified cities, and we're not going to be able to take it. Certainly we're going to die. They're too strong for us. And yet Caleb, Joshua say, no, the Lord is with us. When the Lord is with you. Is any fortified city going to stand? No, they're like dust on the scales to God. And yet Barak here is faithless and fearful. The men of Israel, the men of Israel are fearful and faithless. And so what happens? The Lord then raises up a faithful, a faith-filled woman. In verse 4, Deborah the prophetess sits in the seat of Moses, as it were, judging Israel at this time. In the leadership vacuum, left behind by weak and faithless, feckless and cowardly men, there are often, many times, there are disappointed and discouraged women. Isn't that true? Often in the absence of male leadership, there are disappointed and discouraged and dejected women who love the Lord and want to serve Him. But often in the vacuum of leadership left behind by weak and faithless men, there are often domineering, often deluded women who want to take control themselves against the command, against the instruction, against the clear plan that God has laid out. But sometimes... As here, the Lord raises up a fearless and faithful woman to follow, or to follow the Lord and to lead the people. So Deborah here is that one who's been raised up. Deborah sends for Barak, and Deborah reminds Barak of the command. Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded Barak, go deploy troops at Mount Tabor? So here, at Deborah's reproof, you could say, Barak musters a little faith, maybe just about the size of a mustard seed. And Barak says to Deborah, I'll go, but I don't want to go alone. <laughs> I don't want to go alone. Will you hold my hand? <laughs> Will you go with me? I'll go, but only if you go with me. And what we see, what we see is not great faith on display. We don't see great faith on display. We see a great God who does great things even through weak and sometimes fearful, failing faith. So, God is going to win the victory. God is going to win the victory, but there will be no glory in it for Barak. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. You've got the Canaanites, 900 chariots, all his cohort, his troops, mighty. And God has chosen weak Barak to go up against Sisera, and God is going to rout the Canaanites before the eyes of Barak. Well, let's see how the Lord does it. Let's see how he does it. Now, point one, we looked at the need of the people, right? Point two, we considered the command of the Lord. Now, point three, look at the salvation of the Lord, the salvation of the Lord. Now, God is obviously the champion of the story. He wins the victory. He delivers the people. He leaves absolutely no question that the glory is entirely his and leaves no question again that we can put our trust entirely in him. And one of the ways in which he does that is by decreeing the ends from the beginning. He says in verse 7, I will deliver Sisera into your hand. How many times does the Lord have to do that for us to get it, right? He decrees the end from the beginning. He calls his agent from a far country and he accomplishes all his purpose, right? The Lord has said it and he will absolutely do it. But in decreeing the end from the beginning, the Lord also decrees the means that he uses to bring about that end. Everything in the middle. He doesn't just say, here's how it's going to end up, but the Lord being sovereign over all things whatsoever that come to pass, the Lord decrees every means laid out like breadcrumbs, right? Along the way, he sovereignly decrees all the means that will bring about that appointed end. And we see those pieces now being arranged beginning in verse 10. Look at verse 10. First, in arranging these pieces, 
We have, entering stage right, so to speak, Barak and Deborah and the troops of Israel. Finally obeying the command of the Lord. Verse 10, Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. He went up with 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went up with him. Now notice, Barak is keeping the commandment of the Lord. He calls Zebulun, calls Naphtali, and 10,000 men, calls them to Mount Tabor. Only Deborah is with him. Now we know from the command that the Lord has given, they were to gather at Mount Tabor in Kadesh, which is southwest of the Sea of Galilee, southwest of the city. This is positioned on the river Kishon, where the battle is going to take place, okay? So first, the Lord arranges Barak, Deborah, and the troops of Israel on Mount Tabor. Second, verse 11, seemingly out of nowhere and with no explanation as of yet, Heber the Kenite is introduced. Where does Heber come from? Look at verse 11. Heber the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Zaanayim, which is beside Kadesh. Now, this is unusual. We don't know where Kibar, Kibar, or where, why he's important to the story at this point. We don't know what's going to happen with him at this point. If you're reading it for the first time, you wouldn't know. We know from chapter 1, verse 16, we know that the Kenites lived in the south. They were Gentiles. They were not of the nation of Israel. And Heber was a bit of a nomad and probably a bit of an outlier. He separates himself from his family, separates himself from the Kenites, and he moves his family far north now, above Judah, far north near Galilee. And it says in verse 11 there, near the Elon. The word literally means the great tree, the great tree. That tree is at Za'anayim. Now, many of your translations say oak. The word was often used of any large tree. Any Elon was a large tree. And oftentimes, large trees just marked an important location, oftentimes a sacred or a spiritual location, a location that had some type of spiritual significance. And most likely, in that area, that geography, the tree was either a terebinth or an oak. So that's why you see your translations say terebinth or oak, okay? It was a great tree, the great tree at Zaanayim. It's not foreign to us, right? Uh, before GPS, somebody would tell you, go down the road, turn at the big tree at that corner and go. <laughs> it was a landmark, the big tree. Uh, they're using it in the same way. Now, what a coincidence. <laughs> the tree was beside Kadesh, where Barak just showed up with 10,000 men. Is it a coincidence? No, there's no such thing as coincidences. We talked about that this morning. No such thing. God is arranging the pieces of the battleground. He's putting them in position for the fight, right? God is arranging his great victory, as we'll see. And that reminds us that the Lord executes his decrees through providence. Lord has decreed the end from the beginning, and he executes what he decrees through acts of providence, right? Through acts of providence. We know that toward believers, that that providence includes all things good. His providence is good toward us. He works all things together for good to those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. All right? So God is working out all things according to his good providence toward his people, certainly declaring the end from the beginning, as it says in Isaiah 46.10. And then, Isaiah 46, 11, working all things toward that decreed end, calling, as he says there, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it, the Lord says, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. In those statements, you see the decreed end and the providence of God. God says, I have spoken it, that's what's going to happen, and I will bring it to pass. Right? I will execute my providence to make sure that it comes about. I have purposed it, I've set the ends, I've decreed the ends, and I will also do it. I will bring about those ends by executing my decrees through providence. God doesn't just decree the ends, he decrees the means. Now why would that be important for us today to think about? Right? We don't often understand the circumstances of our life. We don't always understand what's going on in our circumstances. Often, that's very confusing. What in the world is going on right now? Right? I feel absolutely tossed about, confused, and if we're not careful, that can lead us to doubt, 
can lead us to worry, can, can lead us to fret and sweat and toil. And we shouldn't. Why? Because God is working all things together for our good, bringing about his decreed ends, which were always perfect, always good. Right? We can trust the Lord in that. So although it may look to you like your life is in tempest, who's in control? God's in control, right? God's in control. Reminded of the disciples on the boat, right? The boat is being tossed on the sea. They believe that they're going to die. And what's the Lord doing? The Lord is sleeping. That's called faith. That's called trust. It's called understanding that God is in control. The Lord says, I have purposed. I will also do it. Now, in chapter 4, if someone were reading this account for the first time, it's impossible to know at this point what the role the house of Heber plays in the Lord's plans. We just don't know. You can be sure, you can be sure that the Lord is working all of this together. We don't always understand our circumstances. There are many examples of that in the Bible, aren't there? Many examples. Joseph couldn't have foreseen what the Lord would do through his slavery in Egypt. You can imagine Joseph sitting in the bottom of that pit, right? Thinking, what in the world is going on right now? Couldn't have seen that the Lord spared him, sent him into Egypt so that many lives could be saved, right? That God's people could be delivered. Jacob couldn't have foreseen what the Lord would do when he was fleeing his brother Esau, right? He runs for his life away from his brother Esau, says it go, he goes out of the country. When he comes back in, he comes back in with two companies. He leaves with nothing but his staff. He comes back with two companies of people with him. The Lord blessed Jacob. Moses had no idea what the Lord intended by running him into the wilderness and out of the house of Pharaoh. Here's what Moses knew. Here's what Moses knew. That he would rather suffer affliction with the people of God to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. That's what Moses knew. Moses knew that he esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. That's what Moses knew. So Moses, what did Moses do? Moses just lived trusting the Lord. Lived and the Lord directed his steps and the Lord used Moses. The Lord had already decreed the ends and the Lord by driving Moses out into the wilderness fleeing after he had killed the Egyptian, right? God drove Moses out into the wilderness to accomplish his purposes. And Moses, like the rest of us, find out later exactly what all that entails. That's all that Moses knows. Often, we know just as little. We just need to trust the Lord. The Christian life is a matter of faith. The Christian life is a matter of faith. God knows we need to trust him, right? Okay. The Puritan Richard Rogers says this. Great commentary on the book of Judges. The Puritan Richard Rogers says this. All things shall be in time directed by him to a good end, though even though we see it not by and by. And it being so with us, though we see not the mind and purpose of God toward us in the particulars at the first, and what will fall out through the course of our lives, yet we are sure that his special providence watches over us for our good, so that we need not doubt, but that God directs all things to that good end. We simply need a sound understanding of his word, don't we? A sound understanding of the way in which God operates, what God does on behalf of his people, and we need faith. We need the faith to apply his word in our circumstances. We need faith to trust him, to work in them. We need faith to know that God will work through them for our good, and we need to believe it and live according to it, right? Don't worry, don't fret, don't sweat. <laughs> Start applying worldly wisdom, don't do it. God is providentially working, trust him. So, first, in our scene, preparing for battle, we have Deborah, Barak, the troops of Israel. Second, we see Heber the Kenite. Not sure what he's doing here yet, but we'll find out. Third, the Lord puts in place Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army. Sisera is invited to our scene. Now we know from verse 17 that there was peace between Heber the Kenite and Jabin king of Hazor. Heber had no plans to take out Sisera. There was a shalom, a peace between them. That's a, a covenantal word. Uh, it implies a peace treaty 
between the two of them. This was an arranged peace. There doesn't appear to be any animosity at all. In fact, there was a treaty. So, verse 12. They reported. Who reported? Heber <laughs> reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. And so, verse 13, Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from Harasheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. Now, the centerpiece of Sisera's arsenal was the iron chariot, 900 of them. But Josephus, the Jewish historian, records that he also had 30,000 infantry and 10,000 horses. So 900 iron chariots. They were the, the Blitzkrieg tank, the technological advanced warfare of the time. 900 chariots, but he also had 30,000 men, 10,000 horses. What do you think from all this that Sisera is trusting in? Does it matter, ultimately, how many troops Sisera has? No, it doesn't matter a hoot. He walks in darkness. Sisera walks in darkness, do you see? Sisera is trusting in his might. God, like, well, these people, the people of the nations, gathering themselves to get together against the Lord and against his anointed. And what does God do? He sits back in the heavens and he laughs. He holds them in derision. They're like grasshoppers, the Bible says, before him, as nothing before him, as dust on the scales. And our God sits in heaven in omnipotent power and he laughs. And so the scene is set then. The actors are in place. Barak, Deborah, the army of Israel on Mount Tabor. Heber, the Kenite nearby in Kadesh. Sisera and his cohort near the river Kishon. And then, verse 14, Deborah rings the bell. Let the battle royale begin, right? So Deborah said to Barak, verse 14, Up, up, this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? That may have been... Barak, situated on Mount Tabor, looking down upon this vast army and all of Jabin's chariots in, the, in the, the riverbed of the river Kishon, so to speak, and he sees Sisera's force arrayed against them, and Barak hesitates. Right? Barak is fearful. Barak is a little faithless. So it took the voice of faith to press Barak into action whereby his own faith would be strengthened for the fight. Now, you and I, we know, if you've been in Christ for any length of time, exactly what that's like, right? How many times have I, to my shame, been fearful, but some strong brother, some outspoken sister, comes alongside me and charges me up, and we're ready to charge hell together with a squirt gun, right? It just motivates you, charges you to obey the Lord, to put your faith and trust in him. That's Deborah right now to Barak. Up, up, Barak. This is the day the Lord is going to deliver Sisera into your hand. And look, has not the Lord gone out before you? We often need the encouragement of others. We often need exhortation to persevere in the faith. The Bible is full of those one another's, isn't it? Full of those one another's. Exhort one another while it is called today, and even more so as you see the day of the Lord approaching. We need to do that for one another, exhort one another, challenge one another. It's one of the reasons we have a, an evangelism testimony in our service, right? To, to testify the Lord's goodness and grace in the preaching of the gospel and to encourage one another in that good work that we're supposed to do. It's often a difficult work or a fearful work, but we need to be about that business. The Lord says, up, right? This is the day I've delivered the nations into your hand through the gospel. We want to see people saved. We need to be about that work. We often need that encouragement. Believe God. Take him at his word. Has not the Lord gone out before you, Deborah says. So, Barak then, hearing Deborah, taking faith now himself, goes down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And in summary fashion, verse 15, we don't get many details. What we do get is this. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. Now, Barak, as we've discussed, 
shows up later in the New Testament in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. What does it say in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 34? But this, by faith, Barak turned to flight the armies of the aliens. <laughs> by faith, Barak turned, they, these men subdued kingdoms, right? Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. But notice at the beginning of verse 15 here, who was it who routed Sisera? and all his chariots, and all his army. Verse 15, the Lord did that. The Lord did that. The Lord routed Sisera, took out all his chariots, took out all his army with the edge of the sword. Now notice, notice verse 15, the Lord routed the army with the edge of the sword before Barak. In other words, before his eyes. Barak, I'm sure, had a sword in his hand. He had pulled out his sword. They were charging down the mountain, right? They were charging down the mountain, and the army, all his chariots, are taken out, as it were, before Barak's eyes. Um, if you've ever seen the Lord work that way before, we've thought about that here before, like in talking to a new believer. Like you would see the Lord working in them before our eyes, right? Somebody comes in, they're, they're gloriously saved. You see a transformation in their life. Maybe you're married to someone who's been saved and you've seen the work of the Lord in them. It's like the Lord did this miracle right before our eyes. That's Barak. Barak's got his sword out, and the Lord routs Sisera before his very eyes, before him. In other words, the Lord did it. The Lord did it. The word routed, hamam, means to cause motion and confusion. That's interesting. The Lord caused motion and confusion. Same word is used in Exodus chapter 14, verse 24 of the Lord troubling, where it says there in Exodus 14, 24, the, love, the Lord troubled the army of Pharaoh, and he troubled them by the pillar of fire and by the cloud. The Lord troubled their army. The Lord here troubled Sisera. He caused motion, caused confusion. Interesting. There's some kind of miraculous occurrence here that has been brought about by the Lord to cause motion, to cause confusion, to cause trouble for Sisera and his army. And the Lord does it. More about that in a moment. Look at verse 16 then. But then Barak, he pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harasheth Hagoim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. In, in case you didn't get the all, <laughs> he adds, not a man was left. An absolute Miraculous victory, miraculous victory. Behold the victory that God delivered through obedient faith, weak and delayed as it may have been. Is there any doubt, Lord God did this, Lord God did this, is there any doubt that he can and that he will accomplish all that he has purposed for you through the same means? Is there any doubt that God would do that? God delights to give victory through faith. God delights to give victory through faith. Up, right? Up. Obey the Lord. He has delivered your enemies into your hand. Obey the Lord. This is a great victory, but the details are a bit sparse. How did God do it? Well, we're given a little indication in chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. Flip the page. Look at Judges chapter 5. And drop down there to verse 19. Verse 19. And verse 19, the kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Ta'anak by the waters of Megiddo. That's how this, is, this location is referred to here in verse 19. They took no spoils of silver. They took no spoils because they were routed. <laughs> they had no spoils, right? They lost in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 13, it's the river Kishon. That's the marker, if you will, of the location. The Kishon was a river that ran through the Jezreel Valley. We know that geography from the Bible, the Jezreel Valley. Here, it's the waters of Megiddo. Megiddo was a stronghold or a fortress that was along the river in that Jezreel Valley. Ta'anak was the town nearby. Often, Ta'anak and the stronghold of Megiddo were associated with one another, and the river Kishon was often called the waters of Megiddo. That was the river that fed the stronghold at Megiddo. That says in verse 20 then, 
They fought from the heavens. That's interesting. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. In other words, heavenly forces are at work here. This is a way of describing that God was at work. Fighting from the heavens, the stars from their courses fought against Sisera. And, verse 21, here it is, the torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, oh my soul, Deborah sings, right? March on in strength. Go forth and conquer. That should be our response. We read a story like this. We see the Lord work as he does. Our response should be, oh my soul. <laughs> oh my soul. And today, maybe in our colloquialism, it might be, oh my goodness. We don't have any goodness. It would be better to say, oh my soul. Oh my soul. What has the Lord done? March on in strength. Right? Behold the victory that the Lord has won. The Lord has conquered our enemies as well, hasn't he? Lord has conquered our enemies as well. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. The word translated river, in reference to the Kishon, better refers to a wadi. The word is wadi. A wadi was a dry riverbed in a valley, as this one was in the Kishon Valley, the Jezreel Valley. It was a dry riverbed that acted like a channel. Water would pour out of the mountains and would flow through that channel. So when there were heavy rains, where did the rain go? Especially on those mountaintops. The rain would pour down off the mountains into that channel, into that valley, and it would rush through like a flood. Right? That's the torrent, the torrent of the Kishon. Wadi was a dry riverbed. That dry riverbed, as it would begin to get wet, would turn into a bog. It was sandy. You've seen a dry riverbed before, right? It would turn into a bog, you know, Things would sink down into the dry riverbed. Old Westerns referred to this as a gulch or a gully washer. This was a gulch or a gully washer. Easy to cross when dry, clear, open, easy to get an iron chariot across. But when that thing got wet, when there was water beginning to collect, what would happen to an iron chariot? They're made of iron. The thing would have sunk, would have been absolutely useless. And the soft sand, the dirt of the basin, would have turned into a bog when the water began to collect, when the torrent and the heavy rains came, when the flood came. Well, what was a wadi in chapter 4, verse 13, became a torrent in chapter 5, verse 21, sweeping the army of Sisera away. And we see the weapon that the Lord used, so to speak, to take out Sisera and his armies. It's not unlike the Lord taking out Pharaoh and his armies in the Red Sea, isn't it? The Lord used those waters. Certainly, those chariots made of iron became uselessly bogged down in the mud of that riverbed. And the water, like a torrent, sweeping most of the infantry, sweeping the horses away. Those that were left were pursued, the Bible says, put to the edge of the sword until not a man was left. The, Jez the Jezreel Valley became a death trap, a death trap. The Jezreel Valley became a death trap for all except one, <laughs> all except one. Look at verse 17, chapter 4, verse 17. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. Why is it in chapter 4, verse 17, that Sisera would leave the safety of his chariot and flee away on foot? It's because his chariot was bogged down in the mud. <laughs> so Sisera had to alight from his chariot and flee on foot. He left it stuck in the mud of the wadi. And Sisera's chariots then, what, were, <laughs> what did the Lord do with the might and power of Sisera and the Canaanites? What did the Lord do? He brought them to literally nothing. In a moment, brought them to absolute nothing. Sisera's chariots served him no better than Goliath's strength. No better than Goliath's size. No better than Goliath's spear. No better than Goliath's sword. David used his sword to cut off his head with it. He left Sisera, right? Sisera's chariot served him no better than Nabal's wealth. 
Nabal died. Sisera's chariot served him no better than Ahithophel's wisdom. Ahithophel committed suicide. Sisera's chariots served him no better than Haman's favor with the king. Haman was hung on the guillotine, on the, 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 the structure that he built. Uh, it served Sisera no better than the Pharisees' formalism. And it served Sisera no better than will your bank account, your job, your wealth, your strength, your health, your family, your anything. It can be brought to nothing in a moment. What matters? The Lord matters. Faith in Him. What has happened to all those things in which Sisera has placed his trust? They are bogged down in the mud. Just remember how easy it would be for the Lord to sink your trusted idols into the mud and make them literally worthless. So Sisera, chapter 4, verse 17, seeks refuge then with a known ally, ally and here enters Heber the Kenite. Right, the Kenites were allies of Israel in the south, but Heber had obviously broken ties with the Kenites in the south, moved north. And there in the north, he's made a covenant of peace, a shalom, with Jabin, the Canaanite king. Well, we'll consider what happens to Sisera next week as we conclude our study of the workman's hammer. But suffice it to say for now that his dreams of a peaceful retreat, his dreams of a peaceful rest from battle turn into a violent and disturbing nightmare (laughs) with a tent peg through his head. The victory won over Sisera that day was, to be sure, the Lord's victory. However, the Lord chose to provide that deliverance, chose to provide that salvation through faith, weak as it was. That, brothers and sisters, should serve to strengthen our faith. That should strengthen, embolden your faith, my faith should serve to embolden us, strengthen us when we face the armies of our enemies arrayed in all, our, all their force before our eyes. When we fall into fear, doubt, confusion, discouragement, the Lord is our anchor. The Lord is our triumph. Faith is a part, is our part in the victory, our part in the triumph. The Lord has decreed it so. The Lord's going to get the victory, but he's also decreed the means through which the victory will come about. And that means is our faith. And it's interesting how faith gives all the credit, all the glory to God. God gets all the glory. God gets all the credit. And we can sit back and say, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. March on in strength. March on in strength. 1 John 5, verse 4. John says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It's easy, often easy, isn't it, for us to sit back and say, well, these are just Bible stories. These are uh, nice. We can listen to them that way. When you were a kid and you sat down in a circle and teacher came for story time and she opened a little book and gave you a little story. (laughs) Easy to think about Bible stories that way. This is, not, this is not that way. These are not just little quaint Bible stories to capture our imagination or capture our attention. It's easy to detach ourselves from the people and the places and the times and the events and the circumstances and the very real judgment and the very real faith and the very real victory. Uh, we can detach ourselves from those things. And when you do, you render these as nothing more than stories to you. These are not just stories. These are historical accounts, and the Lord has recorded them. The Lord has decreed them in His Word for our example, for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages has come. We're not to see them as just quaint little stories. We're to be charged up by them. We're to think to ourselves, Oh, my soul, (laughs) march on in strength. And it has been this way throughout the ages. Throughout the ages, God has magnified His Word. God has magnified His will. God has magnified His purposes. God has magnified His strength and His power and His might through these biblical accounts in this way, through faith, 
It will be in this same way that God will magnify his word and magnify his will in our day, in our circumstances. He will magnify his will. He'll magnify his purposes. He'll magnify his decrees through his word, through faith, through our faith in our day. He'll magnify himself. He'll magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He'll glorify the work of God in us through your faith in him. And what hardship have you faced in your life that rises to the level of hardship faced here by the Israelites under Jabin, king of Azor? And what trials have we faced? At what point have you ever, have you ever faced 900 iron chariots, 30,000 men, 10,000 horses, flying off Mount Tabor with a sword in your hand to go to battle? When, when have we ever even come close to anything like that? And sometimes we get fraught with worry and distrust just on the drive to work in the morning, right? Mercy. Are we not often as weak in faith and weaker, weaker than Barak? And Barak, through faith, turned alien armies to flight. Hebrews chapter 11. Let the wicked mock and laugh. Let this world heap scorn upon you. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will complete it. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. So let this, let this account of God's greatness, let this account of God's power, let this account of God's sovereignty God's providence, God's working in history. Let this account of God's faithfulness, his covenant loving kindness, let this account of God's deliverance, God's salvation, strengthen and embolden your faith to obey the Lord our God and to go forth and conquer, right? Oh, my soul, march on in strength. We'll close with the words of David from Psalm chapter 20, verse 6. He says, now I know, I know. It's such confidence, right? Such faith. Easy to pass over those words. David says, I know. I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen. Look, they've been bogged down in a gulch, right? Their iron chariots have come to nothing. Their infantry is gone. Their horses are gone. They have bowed down and fallen, David says, but we have risen and stand upright. Put your faith and trust in the Lord who always leads us in triumph. All praise, honor, and glory to the Lord our God and the saving strength of his right hand. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, praise be to your name. Praise be to you, Lord. All honor and glory and praise and worship and might and dominion and power be to you, our victorious and conquering king. Thank you, Lord, that you go before us. Thank you, Lord, that you are the one who gains the victory. Your might, your power, your right hand has earned for us, secured for us the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. And praise you, praise be to you, Lord, that you use the means of our faith to bring that about, just trusting you, uh, looking at you work, watching your glorious might, your glorious power at work. Oh, my soul. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you for this. Help us, Lord, to be charged up, emboldened, fueled in our faith, Lord. Strengthen us. Help our unbelief. Help us to trust in you, to follow hard after you, to obey you, to march on in victory, to march on and conquer. Because you, Lord, have secured peace from our enemies all around. You've won the victory in Christ. And we praise you and thank you for that, Lord. Help us to be strong in the power of your might and to walk in triumph in Christ Jesus our Lord. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for these things. Often in this world, Lord, we're faced with circumstances that will uh, cause us to fear and to doubt. We praise you that you are our strength. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to look to you and gift us faith, Lord, 
to live the Christian life, to persevere to the end in obedience to your word. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage your people with fruit in their battle. Lord, lay uh, the enemies in the valley before them. They might see the victory of our God and glorify your great name and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in it for your everlasting praise. We pray these things in his name. Amen.